trafficking for prostitution indeed bridges many, many disciplines. Um, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about the fact that sin, this is, in, as Jesse mentioned, this is Indigenous Peoples Day. And uh, I don't know if some of you know that San Diego has 13 groups of Indian nations officially federally recognized more than any other county in the United States. These people were not extinguished by colonization. They still live in San Diego. In order to, uh, in order to honor them, their land, their culture, I want to tell you their names. The Barona Band of Mission Indians, the Kawia Band of Mission Indians, the Kumia Nation, the Chemevive Indian Tribe, the Chemewewe Indian Tribe, the Waya A Pop Band of Kumia Indians, the Anaha Cosmet Band of Indians, the Hamu Indian Village, a Kumie Nation, the La Jolla Band of Luiseno Indians, the La Posta Band of Mission Indians, the Los Coyotes Band of Mission Indians, the Manzanita Band of the Kumie Nation, Mesa Grande Band of Mission Indians, Pala Band of Copeno Indians, Pala Band of Copeno Indians, Rincon Band of Luisena Indians, the San Pascal Band of Diagueno Mission Indians of California, the Pei Nation of Santa Isabel, the Sequan Band of the Kumia Nation, and the Viejas Band of the Kumia Nation Indians. There are two other historic events that are very present in my life, and I'm sure yours. One was Brett Kavanaugh, his snarl, his sneer, his contempt, not only for Christine Blasey Ford, but for his colleagues, are not to be forgotten in all these issues that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and we're going to be remembering them as he makes decisions that impact all of our lives. And in addition to Kavanaugh and the fact that this is Indigenous Peoples Day, we just received the devastating climate predictions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just yesterday. Um, and I am reeling from that, as I am sure any of you are who've read that document. I'm going to be talking about fracking and trafficking, inequality, climate change, in the early 80s, I read a study by the anthropologist Peggy Reeves Sanday. And she wrote an article about the connections between how the earth is exploited and how women are exploited. She studied 156 cultures categorized as either rape-free or rape-prone. And she found that when the land was free of exploitation and destruction, women tended not to be raped. And similarly, when the land, in cultures where there was a lot of environmental degradation, there were much higher levels of sexual violence, other kinds of interpersonal violence, and domination of women. I was just riveted by that study. Now today's version of those ideas, thank you so much comes, uh, today's version of those come from the in National Indigenous Women's uh, Resource Center, who have said recently, they treat Mother Earth like they treat women. They think they can own us, buy us, sell us, trade us, rent us, poison us, rape us, destroy us, use us as entertainment, and kill us. I'm happy to see that we're talking about the level of violence that's occurring against Mother Earth because it equates to us. 
What happens to her happens to us. So these incredibly important ideas help me get to the point where I want to make the connections between the business of sexual exploitation and the business of resource extraction. A free market approach to extracting resources puts into action the belief that everything is and should be for sale. Justifying the selling or renting of human <coughs> beings as sex workers uses this very idea. The same rationalization that's used to exploit the land is also used to exploit women in prostitution. These girls got to eat, don't they? I'm putting bread on their plate. I'm making a contribution. They'd starve to death unless they hoard. Now, this argument suggests that money removes the harm. The money persuades, entices, or coerces the person to perform sex, but it still doesn't erase the sexual violence, verbal sadism, and the rapes and prostitution. A forced choice between poverty and pollution should not be government's only two options. And a forced choice between <coughs> poverty and prostitution should not be women's only option. People are trained to have a desire for consumer goods like iPads and cell phones with social competition to acquire these goods. There's sometimes pressure from families and peers to prostitute because it's the only means of acquiring these goods, acquiring these items. While young women may not be physically coerced by kidnapping or hunger, nevertheless, their naivete is intense enough their options narrow enough that yielding to prostitution in those situations, when you want an iPad, cell phone, or let's say for refrigeration needs, it, yielding to prostitution in those conditions might be tantamount to psychological coercion. So the combination of poverty and proximity to financially successful women in prostitution and a consumer culture has sometimes dramatically shifted whole culture's social values about prostitution. So what I'm going to talk about is two different phases of extraction industries that have devastating impacts on women who are vulnerable to prostitution. <coughs> the first one, there's an increase in prostitution when there's a boom market in the fossil fuel extraction industry. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is increases in prostitution are also linked to longer term climate changes like droughts, fires, and floods that affect people's ability to survive. Both boom fossil fuel markets and their long term climate impacts most strongly affect those already vulnerable because of their poverty, their sex, and their ethnicity. <clears throat> Prostitution is connected to fossil fuel extraction in these ways. First, a boom in resource extraction causes an upsurge in the economy. Lots of men are hired to work on pipelines and fracking operations. Historically, these industries have exploited young, poor men who are paid more to perform jobs that no one else wants because the jobs are dangerous and they're unpleasant. Organized criminals like pimps, traffickers, and drug dealers come in to feed off the boom in the money in their pockets. Right now, women and girls are trafficked by pimps to these boom zones like the Bakken oil fields in Canada, North Dakota, and Montana, gold mining in South Africa, mining coltan in the Congo, and certainly logging in Brazil. You see the same phenomena. This is uh, um, what's called a man camp in Williston, North Dakota. The expression temporary plantations has been used to describe the slavery-like system of resource extraction that harms both those doing the work of extraction and the women who are trafficked in at the end of the day to pacify the men. 
What happens to women and girls in the community when a fossil fuel extraction boom occurs? In North Dakota, sexual assaults, domestic violence, and sex trafficking have tripled since 2008 when large numbers of pipeline workers moved into the military <coughs> barrack style housing like this. Even when an extraction industry eventually shuts down, for example, in the case of environmental protests against coltan mining in the Congo, I don't know if you remember this, but this is a, used, this is a precious element used in cell phones and it wrecks like so many other forms of resource extraction do, it wrecks the environment. And uh, men have to get in these mud holes that are up to their chin to find these, uh, the coal pen. Environmentalists protested it, it was shut down. But once the sex trade was established, even after the resource extraction business was finished and done with, Guess what stayed around? The prostitution. It didn't go away. So you have this process of colonization, neo-colonization, and free trade policies. You have use of exploited laborers, extraction, mining, logging. Drugs and women in prostitution are used to pacify workers you have the end of extraction and the sex trade continues, even if the resource extraction is terminated. Now, to talk a couple minutes about the longer term effects of resource extraction on the climate and on the people that are vulnerable who live on the planet. It isn't even in proximity anymore, is it? It's all of us on the planet that are affected um, you know, people in Asia or in Cambodia are being affected right now by our level of consumption. And uh, uh, Filipinas who are fishing are affected by the amount of plastic that's, that's in the fish that they're trying to bring in for their family. So it is literally a global village in, in the absolute most literal sense. Now in the global south, Poor women provide most food, water, and fuel for their families. Climate change severely damages their ability to do these things. Regions impacted by climate change are then vulnerable to exploitation by sex trade businessmen. What you see is in impoverished villages near Lake Victoria, Kenyan women who sell fish because of the scarcity of fish accessible to them are prostituted by the fishermen in order to buy fish so that they can sell to market, which they've been doing for eons of time. In 2016, climate change resulted in the hottest day ever recorded in India, 123 degrees Fahrenheit in Andhra Pradesh. A single mother of three said that her lack of income as a farm worker had caused her to enter prostitution. There had been no rain for years and no work, she said. My friend said, and this is a quote from her, my friend said, how long will you live without work? He said he has a job that can ensure a good future for my children. So I took up the job of a sex worker. I had no other option. Many times clients would beat me, force me to drink alcohol and travel with them to different cities, but I have to tolerate it. And she went on to explain how she loathed that activity in the sex trade. Now, most of, most of us know that education improves the status of women and decreases vulnerability to prostitution. Young women in Ethiopia and Bangladesh report that climate stress has increased sexual violence in the following ways. Girls collect water for their families, and then they go to school. Then they come back and they collect it again. Whereas water collection used to take two hours a day, in droughts, 
the task of collecting water in a thirty pound jug might take up to six hours a day because they were too exhausted following the strenuous water collection girls find it difficult to concentrate on school work and the farther they had to go to get water the greater the risk for sexual exploitation the more likely they are to give up on their education and then you get into this whole cycle of marriage at age 12 that isn't a great idea and that's really in some of our viewpoints a form of prostitution in low-income New York neighborhoods caused by after floods caused by Sandy in 2012 houses filled not only with water but with heavy chemicals you will recall a legacy of environmental racism that permitted toxic industries to build mostly in neighborhoods of color. The economic and social forces that channel poor and ethnically marginalized young women into prostitution were evident after Hurricane Katrina. In the two years following the economic devastation caused by the hurricane in New Orleans, Many young women from New Orleans were pimped to Las Vegas. New Orleans, an economically stressed area with a long history of slavery and race discrimination, was the source region for young and poor African American girls. Las Vegas, with its thriving sex trade, was the destination market. When women are unable to find jobs, when social supports for housing, childcare, healthcare, and education are slashed, then women in the US have prostituted for hamburgers or a tank of gas. I have documentation of this kind of activity in the last few years. A 2016 study shows there's widespread hunger among teenage girls in the US and they're prostituting in order to feed themselves and sometimes their families as well, as well. Extractive colonialism's end game can be seen in Zambia. After decimating the country's resources by privatizing copper mines for colonial use, wiping out traditional lands and agricultural practices, the British left Zambia corrupted, bankrupted, and its people disenfranchised. For the past hundred years since the British left, weak laws resulted in illegal mining, massive environmental damages, tax evasion, fraud, and human rights abuses. When I was in Lusaka in the mid-90s, the unemployment rate was very high. Women were prostituting but unemployed men were selling pencils and squirting and washing windshields of cars. In other words, poverty alone does not explain the existence of prostitution. It's poverty and sexism. You have to understand both. And in multi-ethnic communities, you can see the hierarchy of racism in the institution of prostitution. I had a conversation with a woman in Lusaka who said very calmly, like she'd explained this to two or three people like me who asked her about her life. Uh, she said, well, she performed five sex acts. She had calculated it down to the penny that would bring in enough for a bag of cornmeal for her kids to eat that evening. And she described herself as a voluntary sex worker. Now, there was no gun to her head. She wasn't kidnapped. But the coercion of poverty, sexism, and a lack of alternatives is what was pushing her into prostitution. We really need a deeper understanding of how coercion operates in women's lives. We did a study of a hundred prostituted Native American women in Minnesota who'd suffered intergenerational trauma as a result of colonization of their nations, which were primarily Dakota and Anishinaabe. 
the women had suffered overwhelming and lifelong trauma with very high rates of homelessness, domestic violence, sexual violence, and their substance abuse and prostitution can be understood as a direct result of those harms. They, in fact, um, the women, in fact, understood that there was a connection between colonization and their prostitution. Several explained to me that the devaluation of women in prostitution was the same as the colonizing devaluation of First Nations of people. Women in prostitution are seen as commodities. I can't explain commodification at its most basic. I took the kind of girl no one would miss, so when they were resold, no one would look for them. It was as if I sold a kilo of bread. Extractivism, I think that was coined by Naomi Klein. It's the commodification of land, plants, trees, water, and air. It's a dominance-based relationship with the earth. Extractivism. The mentality of the mountaintop remover and the Sierra old growth clear cutter. But this dominance-based thinking has parallels in the attitudes of men who buy sex. I use them like I might use other, any other amenity, a restaurant or a public convenience. I was buying a product, they were just whores. And as one Scottish sex buyer explained to us in, in a series of interviews we did with men who buy sex, Prostitution is where men have the freedom to do anything they want in a consequence-free environment. This commodification of women has disastrous psychological consequences. We interviewed 854 women, men, and transgender people from nine countries and across widely varying cultures on five continents the traumatic consequences of prostitution were really similar, whether prostitution was legal, illegal, tolerated, high class, low class, indoors, outdoors, brothel, strip club, massage parlor, or street. It all looked similar. Two thirds of those in prostitution met diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Now this level of emotional distress is, is at about the same level as the most emotionally traumatized people ever studied by psychologists. Battered women, raped women, combat veterans, and survivors of state-sponsored torture. Symptoms of emotional distress in all prostitution are extremely high. Depression, suicidality, PTSD, dissociation, substance abuse, and eating disorders. We've also learned a lot from interviews with more than 700 sex buyers in five countries now. Their view of prostitution, interestingly enough, mirrors almost exactly what the women tell about what prostitution is really like. Really like. I wish I could go into it more, but these guys don't talk to many people about what it's really like, and most people don't ask the kind of questions that we do, and most people don't spend two hours with them asking them. And they're remarkably candid. In fact, some of them don't even want to leave because, uh, I don't know if it's like a confessional or what, but they really uh, open up about things in very, very surprising ways. Let me just tell you how surprising it can be. I interviewed one young man in London who said, gee, I don't know if I belong in this study because I've only used one, one prostitute, he told me. And I said, well, yeah, you do belong in the study. I really do want to interview you. And after we got through the questionnaires, I said, okay, why only one? That was the question burning in my mind. And what he said, was because I looked in her eyes and I saw the same expression in her eyes that I know was in my eyes when a priest was sexually abusing me 
when I was nine years old. We both, we actually, uh, we both started crying. And I said, wow, we really get it, don't you? And the truth is that when men, that there's a, there's a, there's, you can't continue to buy sex if you have a lot of empathy for the other person. You, if you're buying sex, if you're a man buying sex, you have got to put a huge barrier up, almost a same level of dissociation that the women have. And most men are not looking in her eyes to see what's going on with her. It, it, was, it was an eye-opening experience, I can tell you. But when you do the big statistical numbers and crunch the numbers, we did one study where we compared men who buy sex with men who don't buy sex. And we found really uh, strong differences between these two groups of, of each of 100 men. The sex buyers had a stronger preference for impersonal or non-relational sex. They had a much greater number of sex partners, not just in prostitution, but generally speaking. They more often learned about sex from pornography, they told us. They more often feared rejection from women they had a more hostile masculine self-identification. Their masculinity was defined by dominance and mistrust of women uh, and a number of other variables. And they actually had a history of sexual violence that was more extensive than the men who did not buy sex. And we found big differences in empathy. As one guy said, I don't want to know about her. I don't want her to cry or this and that because that spoils the idea for me. You can see in that statement that for many men, prostitution is the acting out of a masturbation fantasy. It's not a sexual interaction in any way, shape, or form. Um, and what another guy said when asked to explain what it is, he said, well, prostitution is like renting an organ for 10 minutes. Now, when you get into some of these interviews, one man said, if I don't see a chain on her leg, I assume she's made the choice to be there. If there's no physical evidence of force, then her experience is dismissed as voluntary or consenting. Okay. Uh, this naive assumption of consent or choice is disturbing to me. The sex buyer himself is the person that has the real choice. He could easily decide not to rent or buy a woman for sex without sacrificing anything. On the other hand, in almost all cases, women who choose to prostitute are doing so out of direct and indirect coercion. Again and again and again they tell us they don't want to be in prostitution but they don't see viable alternatives. Prostitution isn't a real choice because the conditions that permit real consent are not present. Physical safety, equal power with buyers, and real alternatives, not present. The crucial question isn't did she consent, but has she been offered the choice not to prostitute? That's a question that doesn't get asked. And when women are asked what they need, first on their list is housing. In all nine of these countries, there was a 75% overlap between homelessness and prostitution. Let me talk now about something else, about camouflage and denial, and why this issue is so challenging to so many people. Climate science denial is a lot like prostitution harm denial. Both actively reject the facts, and they use words as camouflage to rename facts, just as torture is renamed enhanced interrogation, and logging of old growth forests is named the Healthy Forest Initiative. So also, 
prostitution is named a choice, work like any other, a victimless crime, or from a dating site, we offer a wide range of personal meeting and relationship opportunities, if you buy that one. Pimps and sex trade entrepreneurs orchestrate denial that's much like the tobacco industries or the climate change denialist playbook. The facts are turned upside down. In response to the avalanche decades of evidence demonstrating harm from smoking, the tobacco manufacturers argued, one, tobacco is not harmful to smokers. Two, smokers' cancer is caused by other factors. Three, well, well, even if you get cancer, you assume the risk by smoking. How do you like that? That very similar logic used in the case of prostitution. Just as science denialists try to reject climate protection policies by denying the science, so also prostitution harm denialists try to reject policies that target prostitution's harms by denying the facts. So there's creation of doubt and skepticism about the facts. Myths and facts, about, let me talk about climate science for a minute. Myths and facts and lies about fracking, disposal wells, droughts, climate change, and about prostitution and trafficking have really created doubt in people's minds. In Oklahoma, which now has more earthquakes than California, think about fracking in our state when you know that that kind of fracking in Oklahoma drove up the number of earthquakes so high, they now have more earthquakes than we do. It just blows my mind. Um, but the Oklahoma Geological Survey, arm in arm with the oil producers, have stated that the swarm of <coughs> earthquakes in that state are probably natural events, and there is, here's the key word, insufficient evidence to say that most, earth, er, most earthquakes in Oklahoma are caused by fracking disposal wells. That position has no published research supporting it, and there are at least 23 peer-reviewed published papers that conclude the opposite. So science, by the way, addresses correlations between events, not absolute cause and effect. Smoking can never even be said to cause cancer, but it's strongly enough correlated with cancer that most of us choose not to smoke nicotine. In California, our governor has approved 23,000 oil and gas drilling permits, aligning with the fossil fuel industry whose business model is wrecking the planet. I would like to point out that from Kern County to South Central Los Angeles, nearly 70% of people living near the drilling sites are minorities. Oil industry executives tell us that fracking doesn't cause earthquakes. It's the disposal wells. That's like saying, I stole the rope, but failing to mention there was a horse attached to the end of the rope. In the case of prostitution, the parallel lie goes like this. Only a small amount of people are trafficked or coerced most Prostitutes willingly choose it. Again, the actual facts are turned upside down. Most people do not choose prostitution. It's generally agreed a tiny minority, often people who are benefited by race and class and education, dabble in prostitution for a little while and then get out. The estimate is 2-3% of everybody in prostitution, a tiny minority. We hear minimization of coercion and violence from sex buyers themselves. A John told me, well, yes, I know she was raped by her pimp, but only once in a while, not every week, he said to me. So... Um, 
in, again, in the case of, of prostitution and, and climate change, we see names used to confuse people. We've got the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which put out a report many years ago and just put out this second one, a reputable association of climate scientists who published libraries full of peer-reviewed studies on what's happening to the climate. But soon after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, the Global Climate Coalition was formed. What was their purpose? To deny climate science. That's what they've done for a long time. We have exactly the same thing in the case of prostitution. The Coalition Against Trafficking in Women is a, an organization that understands prostitution as a form of violence against women. After the first group was formed some years later, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women, sounds good, doesn't it? They were, for, they were formed and they promote sex work as a reasonable job while going tit to tit about trafficking and nobody quite knows how much trafficking is going on, they say. So the issue becomes harm reduction versus harm elimination. Extraction industries allege that drilling for oil can be made safe. Despite spill after spill, they still say they can fix the pipes. Harm denialists say that prostitution can be made safe if legalized and regulated or if it's moved indoors, and there's little or no evidence of this. But is, it's repeated as a mantra so that you think it's true. There's tension between those in the climate justice movement who want an immediate ban on fracking, on the one hand, and those who think they've developed best practices in partnership with oil industry groups that will permit some drilling and supposedly mitigate environmental damage by things like purchasing carbon offsets. This is the same tension that exists between those of us who want to end prostitution and those who want to fix what many of us consider to be an unfixable institution. We need prostitution harm elimination, and we need fossil fuels left in the ground. So, the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board actually has, which is oil and gas producers, as part of public school programs, they teach little bit curricula to kindergartners and petroactive curricula to sixth graders. A similar deception aimed at favorably influencing opinion on prostitution works like this. Prominent advocates publicly identify themselves only as sex workers, but they hide beneath the banner of labor unions, even though they're in fact often people who have been convicted of pimping and pandering, and in some cases, interstate trafficking. In the case of Robin Pugh, the founder of SWAP, the sex workers organizing project, project. Yeah. outreach, sex workers organizing project, outreach project. Um, there's probably a branch here in San Diego. Uh, Eliana Heal, who presented herself as a sex worker advocate, was an advisor to UN Women, UN AIDS, uh, she was convicted in 2015 of trafficking at least 200 women in Mexico City. Maxine Dugan in my backyard, Erotic Services Union, has been convicted, uh, charged with felony promotion of prostitution and money laundering. She pled guilty to pimping. Um, these are people who present themselves in a sympathetic but very deceptive way while really being involved in more sinister, harmful activities. In the San Diego area, Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Gates uh, talked about how many women and children have been manipulated, tricked, or coerced into prostitution, especially by gangs and organized crime. All high schools, they told us, 
all high schools in San Diego reported pimp recruiting in their schools. And homeless and foster youth are especially targeted by pimps. Not everyone in prostitution is trafficked, but most are. We reviewed 18 studies and um, 18 reports about pimping in Europe, Asia, and North America. 84% of adults, this is not children, these are people over the age of 18, 84% were under the control of a third party or a pimp. Is he called a pimp? No, or she. Called a friend, their husband, you know, their manager. People don't use the, it, in the sex trade, people don't use the word pimp. State anti uh, and Sigma Huda has said, most of the time prostitution meets the legal definition of trafficking the international legal definition, which is much better than the US law, the Palermo uh, Protocol for Organized Crime. Do, consent is irrelevant in the Palermo Protocol. They have an understanding of the more psychological and hunger-based drivers of prostitution. Consent doesn't matter. So state anti-trafficking laws, for those of you who are activists, must include all trafficked and pimp people, not just children. If I get another email from another politician sending me vanity legislation about how trafficking of children is just terrible, I think I'm just gonna, depending on who did it, scream or cry. Um, it, these are toothless pieces of legislation. We need to go after prostitution of adults. Everyone and all of your local pimps think prostitution of children is a bad thing. The fight politically, socially, and legally is about the prostitution of adults. Those people who just blew out their 18th birthday cake, but they've been in prostitution since adolescence, but suddenly once they hit 18, it's a choice. I don't think so. What would have happened with slavery in the US if we had been running around abolitionists to plantations and asking people, are you a kid? Are you under 18? Come with me, I'm gonna put you on the Underground Railroad, but not your mama and your cousin and your older brother. I don't think that would have worked. We're after the whole institution, not just some people that we decide are the most harmed. And who can argue that children are not the most harmed? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. That doesn't matter. Everybody should be able to have the choice to not be in prostitution. So in conclusion, let me just say a couple more things. Um, this is one of my favorite guys, Detective Chief Inspector, Head of Anti-Trafficking Unit, Criminal Investigation Department in Gothenburg, Sweden. <coughs> Set, uh, Thomas Ekman says, trafficking is a business we're trying to destroy the market. So we don't want to just focus on pimps in the field of prostitution. Our challenge is to reduce barriers to holding sex buyers accountable. There is a law that does that from Sweden. They arrest sex buyers. And the law is more like a felony than a misdemeanor, which is all we have here. In order to, to follow what this Swedish model law does, which arrests sex buyers, decriminalizes entirely the person in prostitution who is understood to be a victim of socially oppressive forces um, and offering exit services. That's the third thing. San Diego could do this tomorrow by doing one or two things, just like Seattle. Arrest sex buyers, advertise that you're going to do that, not welcome in San Diego, do not arrest anyone in prostitution. And there comes a kind of moral 
argument sometimes. Well, we have to arrest them. Well, we, the cops will say sometimes, we have to arrest them to get testimony out of them. And what I say to them is, get the testimony out of the John. They know way more about trafficking networks, websites. Just take one little look at their cell phones, which is like a drug dealer's black book in terms of evidence. Just look at the cell phones. You'll see who they called, how much they were told they were going to pay, according to another guy in law enforcement that I love, Derek Marsh from Orange County, he's now retired. Derek wants to charge sex buyers with RICO, conspiracy to trafficking. It, it, I think it's an idea worth thinking about. Um, so we have to stop being surprised by massive corruption. We have to valorize courage and creativity. And up in the Bay Area, Congresswoman Barbara Lee was the first politician in the US to link climate change and prostitution. She introduced a resolution in which said, and I quote, uh, dwindling supplies of food and water will cause more women to engage in acts of prostitution. Now, what do you think the response of Congress was to that? She was mocked and ridiculed and hasn't really brought it up since because of the intense backlash. But she's absolutely right. It's common sense. Another stunningly creative response that I love is in New Zealand, nature was just defined as a legal entity with rights, which I, I, I just love this kind of creative response to the dilemma we find ourselves on in this, on this planet. It's, um, it's inspiring. And the and some of the activities of people under the age of 18 who really get it, they're going to be living in it long after some of us in this room are gone. Um, their activism is an inspiration. So thank you. I think there's a few minutes for questions and comments, if you have any. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you would approach the sex workers, uh, sex workers the sex buyers to ask them questions and how they trusted you in complying whatever they told you? When you do this kind of research, you have to be as transparent as possible. We tell them the truth. We're an international research team seeking to learn about prostitution. We operate under professional research ethics. Confidentiality is guaranteed. They're still pretty paranoid. Some of them think it's a police sting in some locations in the US. So, for example, in Boston, we did interviews in, um, near the McDonald's in the Boston train station so that they could get away fast if they wanted to. But we sat there two hours with them. It's astonishing. Before we start up every place in the different countries where we've done this, I always think the day before, what if no one calls and wants to come in for an interview? Never happened. We're deluged with calls, a lot of whom, not, not a lot, a significant percentage think we're some kind of sex trade, <laughs> new sex trade uh, gimmick. Me, researcher, you, John, ho, 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 or something like that. <laughs> but um, so we get that. And we get masturbation phone calls. But we get a lot of men who choose to participate. And we pay them for their time. Sorry, we want to be sure we don't waste our time with people not showing up. We, a lot of researchers do that. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm assuming that the age difference when you say children is different for you as, as compared to foreign? Um, is it younger and foreign than it is here? 
like were is children considered um, under 18, but it's like teenage 15, 16 versus born is 10, 11? I don't think there's that big of a difference, but I've never actually calculated that. We've got charts of the average age of entry in nine countries. And I don't think there are very many differences. I think it's probably true when you have crushing poverty, younger women get into prostitution and die earlier, among other things. But it's not just a good thing. Thank you, because um, this thing, and, and um, thank you so much for bringing it, for bringing the attention to it. Um, I'm born and raised here in San Diego, and I, I went to high school here, and it was something that was being brought up as in class, like which is weird, like you think, and now as an adult, I'm looking back at it and can see it from an adult perspective from when I was a teenager. Um, Luckily, I had parents who were very involved, and I was into sports, and I there's no way I could be outside the house at nighttime without my parents knowing. Like, that was never something on my agenda. But the classmates were the ones doing it. It wasn't adults coming into to school. It was the younger brothers. It was the little cousins, the little homies, who you want to call them, of the gangs that were doing it with their classmates. And then once enticing them would take them to the older brothers or the uncles. And so it and doesn't seem now when you're looking at it that, oh, they were choosing to because they were young and naive and oh, they should know better. But it was classmates. It was the, the, the feeling that it was a friend. And um, as I'm talking to women now that I went to school with and at other high schools around that were the same age and seeing that this is still a problem now because it's still happening in the schools of the entry being the classmates and not when we think adults are coming there to get the children. I mean, do you see how many issues are connected here? The quality of education in our state is not inspiring to children, to put it very politely. And um, in many neighborhoods, what are the options for boys? Drug dealers are pimps, and girls, hoes. I've had kids say that to me. That's, you know, what? You think I can go and get... They, they act like I'm crazy to even think that they could have some kind of a normal job in some people's neighborhoods. I'm talking in the Bay Area about Richmond, which is an atrocious place for education and opportunity for people of color. But, I mean, education is connected, job training is connected, racism is always in there. Um, so many, so many things are part of this picture of who gets into prostitution and who manages to stay out. So is there another question? Anything else? Or comment, too. You don't have to ask a question. Hi. Um, I just wanted to bring up the fact that I, I personally think that globally we have always had deniers of climate change and of social issues like this. Um, do you think that it's more up to the cities that have to bring up those legislation and that regulation um, to bring um, awareness, you know, of the issues surrounding like climate change? Because I know, you know, the city of San Diego is very active with like a zero waste plan. Um, and there are different agencies that are really taking that on. What do you suggest? I, I, I mean, I think what you're saying is, um, it, well, here's one response to it. It seems overwhelming when we look at it globally. But if you look at it, let's say in your neighborhood, in your dorm, in your community alone, it seems a little more doable. I mean, that's what a lot of people are recommending is very local action. And keeping an eye on the global connections, but really focusing your action on something a little more than recycling or not using plastic bags. That is really not enough, according to this intergovernmental 
panel on climate change, which says we have 12 years. That's what they're basically saying. So does that answer your question or? Okay. Naomi Klein has a lot to say about this. <clears throat> Anybody else? It seems to me like in modern life, uh, because we don't have enough appreciation for humanity, which means understanding how our inner, inner humanity relates to the outer world, we've been bought off by consumption as a solution. So that, if that's the case, then extraction is absolutely necessary because that's how you satisfy distance between relationships between human beings that causes all of these things because we do not value others enough. And so, because I'm thinking like a part of my thought was, uh, well, I still am not sure, is that, is that in a way that we've made it a kind of a market structure. I mean, in the old days, you know, like the Romans as an example, whatever tribe, they go and they conquer people, they kill the men, they rape the women, right? And so, so that's always been a kind of hierarchy of sorts. But now we've turned that into a kind of market feature. So part of it is that we have refused to let some of those Well, I do think we have uh, a hard wiring as predators. It's a matter of what you do with it, how you understand it in yourself and decide which way you're gonna go with it or not. I do think that um, uh, we think we're really special as an astro. I was reading this astrophysicist the other day this guy named, um, what is his name? I just pulled, I ran out of time to quote him. But I, I do think we have to stop assuming we're rational because we're really not. Um, you know, this astrophysicist, a guy named Adam Frank said, we think we're not part of the biosphere, that we're above it. We're not. I mean, that is so basic. But we have the technology to fool ourselves. I mean, speaking of disconnectedness and compartmentalization, I went to a bar mitzvah of a friend's kid. The dinner before, you know, what, what was I doing at age 12 and 13 uh, when we didn't have cell phones? I mean, we were all flirting with each other. This is a table full of 12 and 13 year olds, all of whom are glued to their phones. I almost, I mean, at first I was shocked and then it was so sad. Like six or seven 12 or 13 year olds getting together for a major social event like this. I mean, it's very severe disconnectedness that's happening that we, don't fully understand the impact of, and we have the technology to, to have, the industrial 
I mean, this, guy, this astrophysicist said there have been many other planets that hit industrialization and Venus might be one of them, which at one point had water on it apparently and is now 700 degrees. So I don't know. I think we should really think about what we want our remaining time to look like, how we want to treat the people that are the most vulnerable around us. I mean, if there's some broader philosophical message in all this, it's that we really should look at the nature of our relationships with other human beings, whether it's dominance, more equality. Um, I don't know, that's just some thoughts.